Welcome everyone to our event today. We're just giving people a few minutes to join and then we'll get started. We're excited to have you. Hello everyone, um, welcome to our webinar today on the future of the modern contraceptive mix. My name is Emily Hoppus and I'm a senior technical officer on the product development and introduction team at FHI 360. As a part of my role, I manage the Contraceptive Technology Innovation Exchange or the CTI Exchange, which is a platform intended to grow the global contraceptive research and development ecosystem through collaboration and knowledge sharing and events like this today. We're excited to be hosting this webinar today with FP2030, which is a global movement dedicated to advancing the rights of people everywhere to access reproductive health services safely and on their own terms. We're hosting this webinar today in partnership with FHI 360, the Population Council, PSI, and the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition, which is an amazing group of partners that have worked really hard to put the event together today. Uh, next slide. So a few logistics before we get started on our event. We will have interpretation today in both Spanish and French. And um, on the screen, you'll see some instructions on how to get those interpretations set up. So I'll just pause for a few seconds so that people are able to read this and get it set up for themselves. All right, next slide. So as I said in the chat, you can introduce yourself there, but for questions today, please use the Q&A function. Um, you can get that on the main menu of the Zoom. It says Q&A and you can enter your questions there for our speakers. Please feel free to do that throughout our presentations today and we'll address some of those at the end of our presentations. Um, please remain muted throughout the event and we will also be recording this event today. Um, and we'll send out that recording and slides to all of our registrants once this is finished. Uh, next slide. So today we have three exceptional speakers joining us um, to talk about three different contraceptive technologies. I'm also really excited to introduce our moderator today, Kirsten Vogelsong. Kirsten is a senior program officer for contraceptive development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She has over 25 years of experience managing and coordinating contraceptive research and development and other reproductive health research activities. After earning a PhD in neurobiology and physiology with a focus in reproductive biology, Kirsten served as a science and Dipl diplomacy fellow in the Office of Population at the United States Agency for International Development. Throughout her five years at USAID, she managed the creation and execution of contraceptive and other reproductive health technology research and product development agendas, including for hormonal and barrier contraceptives and HIV prevention technologies. 
From 2001 to 2012, Kirsten served as a scientist in the Department of Reproductive Health and Research at the World Health Organization. In this role, she led the department's efforts to develop contraceptive methods for men to use, as well as research to support the development of novel methods for women. She also supported clinical research to inform global family planning guidelines. Kirsten joined the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in 2012 to support the foundation's contraceptive research and development strategy. She manages a portfolio for grants related to imagining and developing new contraceptive methods intended to meet the very varied needs of women in low resource settings. Kirsten has also worked closely with other foundation teams in examining issues of intersections between family planning and HIV. So now I will pass it on to Kirsten to introduce our speakers and give us a bit of welcome. Thank you, Emily, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be partnering with the um, webinar uh, organizers um, today to, um, to share uh, the the latest thinking um, and some developments on um, developing methods that really will define the future of the modern contraceptive um, method mix. This is a, an important topic, um, and uh, I, again, you know, thank my thank you to the to the organizers and to the webinar um, conveners. We know that family planning is one of the greatest anti poverty innovations the world has known. And one of the smartest investments that funders uh, and countries can make um, to support their populations. To unlock progress on any of our development goals, from reducing poverty to advancing gender equality, we must prioritize couples' access to family planning, supplies, methods, information, and services. Women, girls, men, couples everywhere should be able to access quality health care in their community at a price they can afford. Evidence shows that when women, girls, and couples have access to contraceptives and quality family planning services, we unlock a cycle of empowerment and prosperity that benefits everyone. More girls can finish their education, have better job opportunities, and explore work outside the home, building a brighter future for themselves and their communities. If we were to enable all couples, all men, adolescent girls, couples, um, to, to access family planning methods of their choice and to, and to um, achieve their family planning goals, we would see 76 million fewer unintended pregnancies every year, 46 million fewer abortions every year, 26 million fewer unsafe abortions every year, and 70,000 fewer maternal deaths every year. Fewer women would die from pregnancy-related complications and more children would survive childhood, in part because parents could devote more resources to their child's health and education. However, today, over 200 million couples around the world who do not want to get pregnant are still not using modern contraceptive methods. Many aren't using family planning because current methods don't meet their needs and lifestyles. Women and girls, men's, couples, contraceptive, and other reproductive health preferences and needs change over time. Yet contraceptive technologies have remained stagnant for generations. We need new and better family planning and reproductive health um, options that evolve with women's and couples' needs and address the barriers that prevent them from using methods that are available today, from access to affordability. We must invest in developing options that place care directly in the hands of women and couples, such as long acting, hormone free, user controlled methods. So couples and women are empowered to make their own contraceptive decisions on their own time. But contraceptives and other reproductive health technologies are not a one size fits all. No one method checks every box and what works for an individual woman over time of what for an individual woman at one time will change over the course of her lifetime. The challenge that users face is that the modern menu of options often comes with stark trade-offs. We know that women and couples are, are making decisions about um, what methods to use based on things like discretion, efficacy, side effects, service delivery, partner buy-in, and other and a range of other methods. 
We believe users will be best served if we begin to imagine and innovate toward new methods and categories based on user-centered design principles. By taking a user-centered approach, we can begin to understand the factors that influence couples' desires to seek family planning services, to seek HIV prevention services, and their ability to access those services and their needs in a product. So I'm delighted to um, be moderating our session today um, and to introduce uh, the speakers um, who have really dedicated their careers to the principles of defining and helping to meet um, varying user needs in and developing new contraceptive methods and new methods um, for women, men, and couples to practice safe sex. We'll start it off um, with Dr. Kavita Nanda, who will be uh, making a presentation on um, biodegradable implants and the exciting work that's gone in in this new category of contraceptive products. Dr. Nanda is the Director of Medical Research at FHI 360 in Durham, North Carolina. She's been a scientist at FHI for almost 25 years. Dr. Nanda is an obstetrician gynecologist in the Product Development and Introduction Department. She designs and conducts clinical studies to develop new contraceptive methods, improve existing methods, and evaluate potential adverse events associated with contraceptive use. She serves or has served as the principal investigator for several FHI 360 studies, including those addressing the safety of hormonal contraceptives among women with various medical conditions. She has also served as a study medical director of several large contraceptive and HIV prevention clinical trials in Sub-Saharan Africa. In this role, she provided leadership on medical issues, including study design, drug safety, recruitment of key opinion leaders, and interpretation of safety and efficacy data. Most recently, Dr. Nanda has served as a co-investigator and chair of the Contraceptive Safety Committee for Evidence for Contraceptive Options, or the ECHO study, a multi-center randomized trial of three different contraceptives and HIV acquisition in over 7,000 African women at high risk of HIV. Dr. Nanda is currently leading a program to develop a biodegradable contraceptive implant. Over to you, Kavita. You're muted, Kavita. Sorry, thank you, um, Kirsten, for that kind introduction. Um, and to everybody, I'm really, really pleased to be here and to talk to you about um, one of my passions here, which is the development of biodegradable implants. Next slide, please. So most of you know this, but the current implants, Nexplanon or Implanon NXT, Jadel, Levoplant, are becoming increasingly popular world, worldwide. Um, you can see here, they're the first or second most widely used method in 10 diverse Sub-Saharan African countries and in other areas of the world as well. They're great methods, they're very safe, they're highly effective for three to five years um, and probably for longer, um, and they're very popular. Next slide, please. With current implants, although insertions um, are often done by lower level healthcare provider, removal requires trained providers as well as the supplies needed for removal. And sometimes these implants can be inserted too deep. Sometimes they can migrate or move a little bit. And so sometimes removals can be challenging. Additionally, users may not have easy access to removal because of cost issues, travel issues, fewer providers certified to remove, and removals can add to the service burden, especially in resource limited areas. Importantly, I wanted to add that even if women have access, some of them may, may want a method that they don't have to have removed. Next slide, please. So we are developing what we call biodegradable implants, uh, also known as bioerodable erodible implants, um, basically implants that don't have to be removed and that dissolve over time. And our goal in developing this was twofold. One is to negate the, remove for remo the need for removal. 
And so that's potentially reducing the associated challenges, costs, access issues, and burden for providers and clinics and users. But also, our goal was to develop a method that has an intermediate duration of 18 to 24 months, so in between current injectables and current implants. Next slide, please. This is not a new concept. You can see here in really small writing at the top that uh, this article was uh, published in 1979. And so um, people have been thinking about biodegradable systems for contraception for a long time. However, some of the earlier products had slow absorption. Um, so the uh, hormone, the progestin that was in these implants took a long time to get to a level that was effective. And they had what we refer to as long tails. The tail is the period between after an implant is completely effective and the time when the hormone or the progestin is completely gone. And so during that time, the method may not be completely effective, it might be partially effective. And there is some concern that there could be a high risk of ectopic pregnancy if progestin levels are not high enough to prevent um, pregnancy very effectively. Uh, additionally, although um, these implants are designed to be biodegradable, sometimes users want them removed for side effects or to conceive or for other reasons. And in the older studies, these partially degraded implants, after they'd started to dissolve for a while, were very difficult to remove. Additionally, um, with some of the older studies, there was a long time. Um, some of the older implants were designed to last for a year. There was an old product called Annuel but it actually lasted for two to three years. Next slide, please. And so for our new biodegradable implant, we have what we call a target product profile, which is really our end goal for what we wanna see in our implant and the, um, what we hope to see on our product label eventually. And so our goal is a highly effective single implant placed subdermally so similar to current implants, just under the skin. We are targeting a duration of 18 to 24 months. We want the product to not have to be removed. So we want it to be biodegradable, but we do want it to be removable for up to six months before the intended duration. Um, and for example, if we develop an 18 month method, we want that method to be removable for at least 12 months. If it's a 24 month method, we want that to be removable for 18 months, um, but we don't want it to require removal. Once the product uh, or the hormone has done with its period of effectiveness, we want a rapid and predictable return to fertility. And we want side effects to be no worse than with approved implants and ideally better. Next slide, please. Uh, the first product that's a little further along that we're working on is something called Casia S. This is a collaboration with PH Sciences and Jacia, as small companies. And this is a biodegradable uh, pellet implant based on an older technology. Um, it was a technology that was used with the annual implant that I referred to, which is a combination of a hormone and cholesterol. But we are using the old pellets had uh, norethindrone and we're using etonogestrel or ENG in this pellet. This is a small pellet, it's six millimeters, and we have a different design. I spoke earlier about the tail and how we want to make that shorter um, to make sure that once the period of effectiveness is over, that it goes away quickly. Um, so we have this core shell design where the core, uh, I don't have a pointer, but you can see the sort of color change here. The core is inert and the outside, the shell is what contains the hormone. And we hope that once the um, hormone uh, is done with um, providing a period of contraceptive effectiveness that we desire, that it'll quickly go away. Um, but the, but the uh, shell, I'm sorry, the core part, which just contains the non-hormone will remain somewhat intact until close to the end of the period of effectiveness. So that removal could be done. Um, if desired. Next slide, please. The current status of our program is that we have in vitro studies that do support proof of concept, including proof of concept of this core shell design, um, leading to rapid drop-off after the period of effectiveness. 
We have done a rat pharmacokinetic study that showed that these implants do release etanogestrel in rats. And we have funding from the Gates Foundation for our first in human phase one trial. So this implant has never been studied in humans. Um, we have funding for uh, end user acceptability studies and also further formulation development. We are going to be doing our first study um, under the FDA under an IND or investigational new drug application. And our phase one protocol has been completed. It's been approved by the IRBs. The end user acceptability studies are underway. Um, some have been completed. And um, the, our pharmaceutical development team uh, and collaborators are working on formulation process optimization. Right now, this um, pallet is made by a small company using um, a very labor intensive process. Uh, however, this is not something that would work uh, for larger scale manufacturing. And so um, our team has been working on uh, optimization of that process. Next slide, please. And I'm excited to tell you about our um, phase one trial. Um, this, as I said, is a first in human trial. So uh, first time we're gonna put these pellets in humans and uh, it's going to be done at a single center. Um, we will be evaluating pharmacokinetics or PK as well as safety and removability. We don't think that there will be many issues with safety um, because we're using etanogestrel, which is used in Nexplanon as well as in um, uh, the Nuvaring. Um, however, uh, this particular pellet has never been studied in humans, so it will be important to look at that. And we will also be looking at removability at various time points because we want to make sure that it will be removable to meet our target product profile. So the overall goal of our trial is to select a dose for further investigation um, of Casia S that is safe, that has a PK profile consistent with contraceptive protection for at least 18 months, and that is removable for at least 12 months. Next slide, please. So our specific study objectives, our primary objectives, um, and I uh, wanted to mention that we're sort of doing this trial in three parts. Uh, initially, we're only going to look at one pellet and look at preliminary safety and pharmacokinetics, uh, see what happens, make sure there's no burst or large um, rise of PK when we um, uh, um, insert the pellet. And we also wanna look at removability early. We don't know how long we'll be able to remove this. And so we wanna look at the first time point of 12 weeks around three months to make sure it's removable. In part two, we're gonna insert two pellets and then look at um, pharmacokinetics over a longer duration of time, as well as removability at uh, around six months and a year. And then if those are successful and if everything looks good, we'll move on to part three. And in part three, we're gonna choose a dose. So we may use one pellet, although that's unlikely because it's a small dose of etanogestrel, two or three pellets. And then we're gonna look um, all the way through uh, through 18 months and um, actually potentially up to 30 months to see what happens to hormone levels and to evaluate the tail that I spoke of. Our secondary objectives are to evaluate safety and local tolerability. So uh, making sure there are no systemic effects, adverse effects, as well as skin irritation, um, uh, skin lesions, hypopigmentation, anything like that. In addition to removability, we wanna look at ease of insertion, make sure that these are easy to insert. Um, we're going to look at um, ovulation suppression in terms of follicular and luteal activity using um, monitoring of serum hormones, especially serum progesterone levels. And we also want to make sure that um, these pellets don't move. They are small and there have been case reports of other hormonal implants like Nexplanon migrating, sometimes migrating far, um, you know, to the lungs, for example. So we are going to be tracking my, uh, migration of this pellet very closely using ultrasound and another novel technology to, and as well as um, palpation to make sure that the pellets don't move from where they're inserted. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, this will be a single site. We're going to be doing this um, with our colleagues at Profamilia in the Dominican Republic. Our study population for this study will be healthy women 
um, at very low risk of pregnancy. Um, in fact, in part one, most of the women will have um, had permanent, sterile, uh, permanent contraception. Um, 18 to 45 years old with no contraindications to contraceptive implant use. And we hope to start this, start this study later in 2023. As I mentioned, this study is um, under an IND with the FDA, and we've been going back and forth with them about some questions they've had uh, about our study and about our study trocar, which is the device that's used to insert the pellets. Next slide, please. So that was Casia S, and that's the um, biodegradable implant that's a little further along. We also are um, very excited to be working with collaborators at Yale to develop um, a different biodegradable implant. And this has a long chemical structure here. It's a novel copolymer, and I'm not going to try and say its chemical name, but because it's a novel copolymer, um, there are additional regulatory considerations that are different than with cassia, which contain cholesterol and phosphatidyl chyla, uh, choline, which are not novel and which are more natural. Um, so uh, this, I, the idea of this novel copolymer is that it remains mechanically strong during biodegradation. So that should facilitate removals um, and hopefully lead to removals uh, uh, closer to the period of the end of effectiveness. Um, and this is a collaboration with Dr. Mark Saltzman at Yale University. Next slide, please. Um, this is earlier on, but we do have some rat pharmacokinetic data. And you see here uh, a couple of um, different uh, plots here. And in these studies, we use sino implant or uh, levo plant as a control. And they looked at different lengths of this um, novel copolymer. This um, polymer or this implant contains a different progestin. This contains levonorgestrel or LNG. And so they were looking at different loading um, of these implants, as well as different lengths, to see what would be closest to the sino implant control implant in rats. Um, and in this study, these are what are called monolithic implants. So they're not these. This particular um, study was done using uh, not a core shell design. So the the hormone is sort of interspersed. Um, uniformly through the implant. Um, in these studies, they did see an initial burst, as you can see to the far left of the graph. Um, this was seen both in vivo in rats and also in vitro. Um, these implants did show sustained release for 20 months uh, that you see here on the graph and higher, either higher uh, levonorgestrel load or longer implants uh, led to higher LNG levels over time. And uh, they also found that at least in rats, this implant was easily removable. Next slide, please. Uh, the current status of this project is that um, uh, our collaborators have developed a core shell implant similar to what I showed you for Casia S. And as I mentioned, that's to control the release duration and to minimize the tail. And they've modeled some release kinetics as a function of the core shell ratio, how thick the core is um, and how big, the, uh, how thick the shell is and how big the core is. Um, we've also conducted a toxicological risk assessment. Uh, this is a novel polymer, as I mentioned. And so we wanted to get a preliminary, um, preliminary feedback from the FDA as to what would be required in terms of non-clinical testing for this implant. And because this is a novel copolymer, um, they've already told us that they consider this implant without even the trocar used to insert it as what's called a combination product. So a drug device combination. Um, our partners have developed a scalable process for manufacture of these implants. And they have manufactured implants, that, uh, these core shell ones that will be evaluated in a second rat from coconetic study that'll help inform selection of our lead formulation. So this study, this uh, product is still a little far away, but hopefully um, in the not too distant future, we hope to be going into humans with this uh, implant as well, because it has some advantages as I noted. Next slide, please. As Kirsten mentioned, 
It's really important to understand end users and other stakeholder perceptions of product attributes. And so at the same time that we're planning to do these um, clinical trials and this preclinical work, one of my colleagues, Dr. Rebecca Callahan, also Dr. Alice Cartwright have been doing these um, end user studies. And uh, one thing I wanted to point out was they had done some preliminary studies and one of the concerns in the preliminary studies was that users didn't understand or potential end users didn't understand the concept of the implant dissolving or the biodegradability. And so that was one thing that um, they paid particular attention to in these in this next group of studies. And so this was a big effort. It involved focus group discussions as well as in-depth interviews with both potential users, providers, and other stakeholders. Uh, and the study was done in Kenya and Senegal. And it was in collaboration with ThinkPlace, which is a market research firm that does have offices in these countries. And as I mentioned, um, there was a broad group of uh, stakeholders that they spoke with. Next slide, please. So I'm really happy to be able to share with you some results from Kenya. Um, these have not yet um, been published, um, but in terms, and then there were a whole host of results, but I'm trying to focus on ones that sort of align with our target product profile here. So in terms of product attributes, most users, um, potential end users did understand the concept of biodegradation. A single implant as opposed to multiple implants was preferred by many, many participants in the study as well as providers. And this idea of non-removal was highly received. A few people did express concerns that if users accept, uh, experienced side effects that could um, require removal or wanted to have um, the implant removed, uh, that they had concerns about accessing a higher level facility due to cost or other um, concerns, that it might be challenging. Uh, for family planning providers, this lack of need for removal was also welcome but they also expressed some concern regarding how easy the implant might be to remove if needed. For most potential users, the appeal of non-removability of BDIs or biodegradable implants outweighed concerns. And for most women under 35 years, as well as those for only one or two children, they really liked this idea of 18 month duration. Um, women who were at the end of their reproductive lifespan, older women, uh, preferred longer um, duration implants. And next slide, please. And none of this work would have been would have been possible without our study team members. We have a huge team working on both the clinical trial, as well as the pharmaceutical development, as well as the end user studies, without our collaborators, as I mentioned, and without our funding. So. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. Um, you'll note that there are several questions. I think there's a lot of curiosity and interest um, on this topic. So please, I, I will um, draw your attention to the Q&A um, and I, I, you'll be able to um, provide um, some brief written answers to the questions um, that are there specifically to the, to, on the biodegradable implant. Thank you for that. Um, switching gears a bit, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Regine Citric Ware, Distinguished Scientist at the Population Council for our next, as our next presenter. Dr. Citric Ware is a reproductive endocrinologist and internist and a Distinguished Scientist at the Population Council's Center for Biomedical Research. In her role of Executive Director of Research and Development in Reproductive Biology, she has conducted research on new product candidates and technologies for men and women, with a particular focus on contraceptive molecules that also contribute additional medical benefits. Dr. Ware has led the team that developed the first one-year vaginal system approved by the FDA in 2018, and she participated in the launch of the first efficacy study for a male contraceptive gel in collaboration with the U.S. National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Dr. Citric Ware is the recipient of the 2022 Society of Family Planning Lifetime Achievement Award. Before joining the council, Dr. C Dr. Citric Ware taught and conducted reproductive endocrinology research at the University of Paris. She has had a career in, in research and development in industry and is a founding member of the International Menopause Society 
and its general secretary for one term. She was principal investigator and directed one contraception research center from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development for 15 years. She has written eight books and over 300 articles addressing men and women's healthcare issues. Dr. Citricware received her MD at the University of Paris, France, and is former adjunct professor at Rockefeller University. Over to you, Regine. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Kirsten, for this very nice introduction. And I'm really um, very glad and honored that you included me in this webinar. Uh, I will try to address today one glaring unmet need, which is bringing to men a contraceptive that is not a condom or a vasectomy. And this project is really a, a large and long-standing collaboration between the Population Council and the Contraceptive Development Program of NICHD at the National Institute of Health. On the next slide, um, you will see the uh, work that we have done in partnership and uh, we, have, we are developing together not only this pain contraceptive gel, but also other contraceptive. And NICHD operates a large clinical trial program, both for male and female contraception. And they use this uh, clinical trial network of very uh, well-known investigators. And they have a dedicated CRO that operates logistics in the US and via partners outside the US. And both Pop Council and NICHD teams oversee the various concepts designed, the operation, and uh, try to troubleshoot and analyze the results of our common studies. In the next slide, here are the uh, names of the main team working. Usually you have the slide at the end, so it's better to have it at the first, so you don't forget to present everyone who has contributed. And the main um, a male contraceptive investigator are um, the Lundquist Institute at Harbor UCLA and the University of Washington with the principal investigator, Christina Wong and uh, Stephanie Page and other uh, partners. Next slide. Another organization working on male contraception is the Male Contraceptive Initiative. And they had conducted in 2017, a large US survey where they showed changing attitudes to uh, the endorsement of responsibility for male contraception by men aged 18 to 44. They have interviewed 1500 men and uh, most of them were white, had no children, less than half were married, and the majority wanted essentially to prevent pregnancy. And 60% noted that they wanted to share the responsibility on contraception as their main motive to use a method. And if you look at the bar chart in orange is the percentage of men very interested by a delivery method. And in dark blue, those who are somewhat interested. And on the top, you see that the majority would like to have a pill before intercourse. And another large percentage wanted to take a pill regularly. And then there is a, a reasonable percentage of people who want to use a topical gel and less men who wanted to have an injection, a shot on a regular basis, or get an implant. And the last three options exist so far as hormonal methods, while on the top, uh, they are hormonal and non-hormonal in preclinical or in early clinical research. Next slide. The mechanism of action of male contraception is probably well known to you. Uh, you see on the left, uh, the brain of a healthy man. You see on the top, the cortex. On the bottom of the brain, you see a small area 
named hypothalamus. And in the hypothalamus, there is a hormone, the gonadotrophin releasing hormone that stimulates the pituitary, this small uh, appendix under the hypothalamus. And the pituitary secretes two hormones, LH and FSH. And this is valid for both men and women. And in men, the LH stimulates essentially the Leydig cells producing testosterone and FSH induce the maturation and production of sperm. On the right side, you see that when we administer a progestin and testosterone in a combination, whatever mode of delivery, it will block the hypothalamus and it will block the secretion of this gonadotrophin releasing hormone. And in a cascade of event, it will block LHFSH and then block the spermatozoid production and the production of endogenous testosterone. So this is why you always have to add testosterone to a progestin or any other agent that would block uh, the function uh, from the GnRH to the sperm production. Next slide shows why um, we wanted to study nesterone and testosterone. And this was a think tank and we had worked together since uh, early 2000 years to develop a provider independent methods, which would be then a user control uh, friendly method for men. The gels can be applied and deliver stable levels. And in fact, when you deliver any hormone in a, in a form of a gel on the skin, it's absorbed through the stratum corneum, about 10% are absorbed. And here we had observed stable levels of both testosterone and nesterone. And by avoiding the pick and throw that you see with oral, for example, it's more efficient and you have less adverse events. The testosterone gel has been also approved for um, hypogonadal men for the treatment of these hypogonadal symptoms. And it has been very well received and not only in the United States, but in other countries, it showed to be very acceptable to men. So we thought that a gel would be also very acceptable. And uh, nesterone that we studied at large for female contraception showed to be a very active progestin with no interaction with other steroid uh, receptors. And therefore we had an expectation of less adverse events. The next slide shows additional rationale for this uh, selection. Uh, Nesterone, I just said, has a high progestational potency. And in women, we showed in female animals and in other um, targets in, in women, it has the highest antiovulatory activity among the available progestins. It has no androgenic, no estrogenic effect. And uh, at the effective dose level, it has no glucocorticoid effect. The product by itself, the gel, as I said, 10% of steroids will be absorbed. It's based on alcohol as the main component. And this is the vector of hormones through the skin. Uh, the uh, reservoir effect of the skin prolonged the half-life, and we have shown that we can find effective levels of nesterone over 48 hours after one application. The advantage of being self-administered by the subject is what we have highlighted, and the gel is colorless, well-absorbed, dries quickly, and leaves no residue on the skin. And that was the main attributes that we had uh, in the target product profile and were verified. In parallel, we um, looked for added benefit and we found that uh, nesterone and testosterone um, enhance neural regeneration, enhance myelin, regeneration. So it's an advantage on the neuronal system, which is uh, really important. 
We also studied the metabolite of nesterone, and we found no interaction with the GABA receptor uh, in contrast to the progesterone metabolite. So we had expected and we showed less effects on mood and sleep, which are changes observed after progesterone intake. Next slide. So the first dose finding study, so we have two dose finding studies here. On the left panel, um, Diana Blythe and her team and the CCTN group has found um, on a three week study that uh, when we tested two, four, six or eight milligram per day of nesterone, we had the highest response with nesterone eight milligram per day associated with testosterone in terms of blocking the LH. So the percentage of participant having uh, LH suppressed to less than one international unit per liter were more than 80%, almost 90% with the eight milligram per day dose. So with this result, we had conducted, uh, we designed the next study, which was a six month study where we measured inhibition of sperm and the sperm concentration with eight or even with a higher dose of 12 milligram for nesterone uh, showed the profound suppression to azospermia starting about eight to 12 weeks and maintained during the time and then recovery occurred at withdrawal of treatment. So there was no difference between eight and 12 milligram of nesterone. So this study showed that uh, the lowest effective dose to suppress sperm was uh, eight milligram of nesterone. And this was published in uh, this uh, years in 2009, the first dose finding and 2012, the efficacy dose finding study. Next slide. These studies were done with two separate gels, one gel of testosterone on the market and one gel of nesterone that we manufactured separately. And here we had to make it more convenient and combine the two molecules into one gel in a small volume with a high concentration of products. And we combine nesterone and testosterone. As you see here in the canister, each actuation will produce a very small amount of 2.5 milliliter, equivalent to about half a teaspoon. And the man would press, would get 2.5 milliliter in his left hand to rub on his right shoulder and 2.5 milliliter in his uh, right hand to rub on his left shoulder. And there is a gentle massage that makes it absorb very quickly. He let it dry. But as it is also in the label of uh, androgel, you have to take cautionary measures to prevent secondary exposure to the woman or to a child if the man would have to carry a child in his arms, he has to cover the area of application, wash carefully his hands, and uh, it's also take a shower um, according to the rhythm of application of treatment. Next slide. The ongoing phase 2B study is the only very large efficacy safety study ongoing now for male contraception. And uh, this is conducted by uh, Diana Blythe and her team and the team of the clinical trial network. And you have seen that it's a, a long-term study. It's two years time commitment for the couples who enroll. They have eight to 24 weeks of observation with measure of sperm count to reach suppression. And when they reach less than 1 million, uh, of uh, spermatozoid per ml, they can enter the efficacy phase where the woman stops her own contraception and they both use the male method as their main contraceptive. And after one year of use, they will enter into a recovery phase and we measure it over six months. 
The target was to enroll 420 couples in order to have 200 couples completing one year of efficacy with a primary endpoint, prevention of pregnancy, of course. And we register also the safety and any side effects, the acceptability, and we measure the suppression of the hypothalamic uh, pituitary testis axis by measuring LH and FSH. You can see on the, on the map that uh, there are now 17 centers enrolled, uh, nine in the United States, two in Latin America, four in Europe, and two in Africa. Next slide. So we have achieved so far major milestones. The, the team had been able to enroll 462 couples we were targeting 420. And when the couples uh, who have reached two sperm concentration of less than 1 million enter into efficacy, at this point in time, 315 couples entered efficacy and 128 have completed a full year of efficacy. So we have uh, um, now an interim analysis, but it we have to be extremely cautious because it's interim. And the next slide, please. You see that we have the majority of men suppressing uh, to one, less than 1 million. In about 12 weeks, the sperm remains suppressed uh, until recovery, and recovery after withdrawal occurs about in 12 weeks. The adverse events are not so different from those observed with female contraception in women, acne, some weight gain, insomnia, mood change, skin reaction, but this is less than 5%, and no serious adverse reaction had been reported. Next slide. The acceptability was rather high. The gel was initially tested for acceptability in the six-month study, and uh, we had more than half of the men enrolled in the six-month trial who say that they were satisfied and they would use this as a primary form of contraception if it was on the market. And the comments from the male and female participants in the ongoing study are very encouraging. They say they wish to keep it, they would like to re-enroll. The women say, I wish I didn't have to go back to my old method. So we were very encouraged by these uh, results. Next slide. So the key messages and challenges, it's necessary to have an increased access and many choices for both men and women, not only for gender equity, but as Kirsten said, to reduce the burden of unintended pregnancy and to decrease the maternal mortality globally. It is difficult to develop contraceptive. It's a long time frame between discovery of a new molecule to drug development and there is no regulatory guidance for male contraception. So we have been interacting carefully with the FDA at every step of all the clinical trial I just mentioned. And we are continuing and opening and paving the way for other uh, male contraceptives in the future. If it's a new molecule, non-hormonal, we know that long-term safety will be needed. We want low cost to increase easy access and low cost is probably better reach with a gel and hormones that I had mentioned, which are not very expensive. And a public-private partnership will be very welcome to complete the development with a very large uh, clinical trial that we have to do now. And the next slide is concluding uh, and showing all the team and partners that are participating in this uh, very large clinical trial. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ware. And I'll direct your attention to the um, question and answer as well, in case there are some questions there that um, you can reply to quickly um, and easily in writing. I'm turning the presentation over to Dr. Bethany Young-Holt. Um, Bethany is the executive director of CAMI Health, which is a project of the Public Health Institute. She brings over 25 years of experience addressing complex public health issues 
with a focus on sexual and reproductive health and health equity. Dr. Young Holt founded CAMI Health, an organization dedicated to advancing the health of women and girls worldwide. She co-founded the Initiative for NPTs, Multipurpose Prevention Technologies, or INPT is the initiative, a global learning network advancing the field of multipurpose prevention technologies. Products that combine HIV prevention, other STI prevention, and or contraception. Dr. Young Holt has conducted research globally using a variety of quantitative and qualitative methods. She is a part-time lecturer at the California State University Sacramento Department of Public Health, where she teaches about the intersection of health, climate, and social determinants of health. Her work has been published in peer-reviewed journals, mainstream media, including Vogue and the New York Times, and in several books. Dr. Younghold obtained her PhD in epidemiology, her MPH in maternal and child health from the University of California, Berkeley, and a bachelor's of science degree in biology from the College of Worcester. Over to you. Thank you so much. And I wanna make sure everyone can hear me. Great. So Kirsten, thanks for the kind introduction. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to CTI Exchange and FP2030 for providing me with the opportunity to speak about multi-purpose prevention technologies as part of the future of modern contraception. So next slide, please. So I'd like to begin today by ensuring that everyone is familiar with the definition of multipurpose prevention technologies or MPTs. MPTs are a class of products that deliver simultaneous prevention of at least two health risks, HIV, other STIs, and or unintended pregnancy. Um, this field builds on over 50 years of contraceptive research and several decades of HIV prevention research. Um, and with that, the MPT field formally emerged about 13 years ago to address the intrinsic links between these sexual and reproductive health risks um, by developing single products with multiple indications. So MPTs could be one-stop shop products that revolutionize sexual and reproductive health, including contraception, by incorporating uh, STI prevention into contraceptives, which are generally less stigmatized um, and therefore could reduce the burden of multiple clinic visits. So the ideal MPT products could be safe, affordable, and easy to use. So as we think about the future of contraceptives, um, I'd like us to imagine single products that people could use to prevent unplanned pregnancy and STIs like HIV, herpes, or chlamydia. Um, I will be talking um, today mostly about cis women because that's where the, the bulk of the research and development around MPTs has been done so far. But the MPT field is evolving to address the needs of other users, including trans men, non-binary people, and cis men. Uh, next slide, please. So let's um, take a look at what's happening around the world. Globally, um, 218 million women have an unmet need for family planning. Um, an estimated 89 million unintended pregnancies occur annually. Every day, 810 women die from pregnancy and childbirth related complications in low and middle income countries, similar to what Pearson described at the beginning of the webinar. Um, HIV remains a leading cause of death for women of reproductive age globally. Um, in 2019 alone, nearly 700,000 people died from AIDS-related causes. So what does this mean for young women? Um, that every four minutes, three young women somewhere in the world acquire HIV. Women and girls in sub-Saharan Africa bear a disproportionate burden of all the new HIV infections. Furthermore, more than a million new curable STIs occur among people of reproductive day, age every day. Um, users want choice to help them make informed decisions about their health. Um, condoms are the only MPT currently available for combined prevention and more options are needed. Next slide, please. So an array of MPTs are in development to help address these intrinsically linked health risks. Uh, this slide um, gives you an overview of the diversity of delivery types of MPTs in the pipeline that can fit the needs of diverse users. 
Um, these include topical candidates, including intravaginal rings, vaginal and rectal gels, fast dissolving inserts, and vaginal films. Um, other MPT candidates aim to provide um, systemic protection, including implants, long acting injectables, oral pills, which are also referred to as dual prevention pills and microarray patches. Next slide, please. So over the past decade, the MPT pipeline has grown to include an array of product candidates. And this has been primarily with the funding from the US government, NIH, and the USAID in particular, and some foundation support. Um, and this funding has gone mainly to academic and nonprofit researchers. Among the activities that my organization does at the IMPT is to track MPT products in development with active funding. And we do this annually and share the outcomes on an online database on our website at mpts101.org. Um, we are updating the MPT database now. Um, currently, there are 28 products in active development uh, with different delivery types, combinations of indications. Um, here you can see the distribution of MPT products in active development listed by delivery type. And you'll see um, many of those that we just covered with the majority of product candidates taking the form of intravaginal rings, followed by vaginal and rectal gels, films, fast dissolving inserts, among others. Um, of these product candidates, more than half combined prevention from HIV and pregnancy, um, also referred to as dual prevention products, and a quarter provide prevention against HIV, other STIs, and pregnancy. Um, the majority are in preclinical or early clinical stages of development with just a couple um, that are uh, in advanced, cl pre -cl uh, advanced clinical trials and, and bioequivalent studies. Next slide, please. So this is a dynamic pipeline with a number of partners and products involved. Um, so I want to now give you, um, provide you with a high level overview of the different types of products in the pipeline, um, the diversity of the product features and indications by delivery type. So if we look at on-demand products, there are fast dissolving uh, vaginal and rectal inserts, and these are similar to suppositories. Um, vaginal and rectal gels and uh, fast dissolving films, all designed to address multiple risk. The fast dissolving non hormonal contraceptive MPT containing grisicin features a non ARV algae based um, antiviral, and it targets pregnancy and viral and bacterial STIs and, and bacterial vaginosis. There is also a topical insert in development that targets pregnancy and HIV, and it could be suitable for vaginal and rectal prep. Um, and it could also be applied either shortly or shortly before or after sex. The gels in development include those that combine non-hormonal contraceptives with antivirals for HIV prevention, um, and others are targeting viral and bacterial STIs, bacterial vaginosis, as well as pregnancy. Uh, next slide, please. So if we look at the more long acting um, intravaginal rings in the pipeline, we see that there is quite a diversity um, in this type of drug development approach. And these could help address the diverse needs of potential users. There are novel drug release mechanisms, an array of drug and drug combinations, uh, and different types of drug uh, target indications using um, this delivery platform. Uh, some approaches are utilizing innovative antibody-based technologies, and there's an increasing number of non-hormonal contraceptive options that also provide STI prevention um, while also uh, delivering combination of hormones. Um, several candidates are using 3D printing or CLIP technology, which could be cost-effective, and this is an appealing feature, particularly for low-resource settings. Um, there are lots of groups working on these, and it will be interesting to, where, to see where these go. Uh, next slide. When we look at implants currently in the pipeline, they are each using... Um, the ones that are in development now are each using a biodegradable approach that targets HIV and pregnancy. 
There's also a long-acting injectable um, in advanced preclinical stage, and it combines an approved um, antiviral and uh, contraceptive and aims to be effective for up to six months. Uh, next slide. Vaginal films are a development that are fast dissolving and could deliver drugs on demand for prevention of viral infections. And in um, this case, they uh, are targeting HIV, HSV 1 and 2. Um, and then there are a couple films that aim to provide longer acting protection uh, from uh, HIV and unintended pregnancy. Next slide. So microarray patches or maps are um, a drug delivery uh, technology that um, uh, delivers drugs by applying them to the skin like a bandage. Uh, and an MPT microarray patch is in development that aims to prevent HIV in pregnancy. There are two oral tablets that are being pursued um, as well, and these are referred to as dual prevention pills. Um, because these um, tablets combine already approved contraceptive and approved antiviral, they were expedited through the pipeline to assess their bioequivalence. Um, criteria for meeting bioequivalence, though, is um, a little bit more complex than what was initially anticipated. Um, so to recap, um, next slide, please. There is a lot going on in the MPT field. Um, there are a number of products across a pipeline from early preclinical development through phase three and bioequivalence. While the majority of the products are still in early stages of development, several have advanced down the pipeline, underscoring the need to smooth the regulatory pathway and really start thinking about manufacturing, distribution, and payment for these future products. Next slide, please. So um, I hope I didn't bombard you with everything that's going on, but you can go uh, and find out more about what is in the pipeline uh, by visiting the MPT database. Um, on this database, uh, you can learn more about the, the different APIs that are being used, the product developers, their funding sources, and more. Next slide, please. So the MPT field is quite complex. It requires bridging traditionally siloed fields of HIV prevention, prevention of other STIs and contraception. Um, but it also requires the integration of social behavioral research that's critical to help ensure that product candidates are developed so that they're used by those who need them. There are regulatory, manufacturing, distribution, and payment considerations that need to be addressed early to avoid um, potential bottlenecks and delays for, for um, promising products as they get through the pipeline. And of course, funding is critical to advance the products through the pipeline. Um, this is where the initiative for MPTs comes in. Um, the IMPT was launched in 2009 as a product neutral learning network that aims to foster an enabling environment to strategically advance the field by facilitating information exchange between diverse stakeholders. So we work by facilitating information in and out between our partners. Um, next slide, please. So a key group of MPT stakeholders is a collection of funders that are interested in supporting this field. As I mentioned, the MPT field is largely funded by a small number of government organizations and funders, namely NIH, USAID, with some uh, foundation support. These funding bodies have diverse mandates and missions. So a challenge is um, ensuring that the priorities and gaps are filled to advance the MPT field and that duplication of efforts are minimized. So to help address this, a group of funders was convened um, by the IMPT starting in 2013 to help identify and priority, uh, prioritize action areas for the field. As of December 22, um, this group has identified five field-wide priority action areas. Um, to help address these action areas, um, we are working with Frontiers for Reproductive Health on a special issue on MPTs, calling for innovative strategies to address these gaps. So we're looking for papers from outside of the MPT field, from other areas that, you know, so that we can, you know, lessons learned 
Um, these action areas are reflected on this slide and they're described in a lot more detail on the Frontiers website. Um, due to time, I won't go into the details here, but hopefully you, you'll um, follow up. Um, so this field is still in its infancy and there's lots of innovation. Uh, the product developers are really shouldering so much of the challenge with regards to drug discovery and navigating the regulatory requirements um, in addition to securing funding. So when we talk about the future of modern contraceptives, it's really critical that we um, clarify the regulatory pathways and these other issues to help ensure these products um, can, can ultimately reach the hands of users. Next slide, please. So despite um, the challenges, we hear from users that they want choice and prevention options that can address their interrelated risk and for HIV and other STIs. So we recently interviewed women um, uh, about their sexual and reproductive health concerns and prevention um, as part of our journalistic style word on the street story mapping projects. Um, uh, and this one was done in areas of Nairobi and Kasumu, Kenya, where high level of HIV prevalence and total addressable market for, for contraceptives overlap. And on this slide are just some quotes from several of the women that we interviewed. One woman says, a product that combines the three of them, HIV, pregnancy, and STIs would be perfect. Another woman says, women would benefit from the NPT. It is something I would recommend to my friends. And a young woman we met said this, abstinence is what we've been told since we were children. Do we listen though? No. So um, also included on the top of this slide is a short video um, you know, of these interviews if you're interested. So next slide, please. So in wrapping up, you know, I just wanna, you know, I think we, we feel that MPTs could be game changers for improved sexual reproductive health globally. Um, studies suggest that over 80% of women prefer MPTs that combine contraception with prevention of HIV and other STIs as compared to single indication products. A recent multinational um, study of male contraceptives uh, suggests a demand for male um, MPTs as well. Increasingly, end user research is being mandated and incorporated uh, into uh, early MPT R&D to optimize MPT attributes that fit with um, users' preference. A range of stakeholders have joined the, the movement for MPTs and contribute to the major strides in the field. Um, as a world is focusing on more self-care and streamlining access to preventive health services to reduce burden on clinics, this has really underscored the need for integrated care and products like MPTs. So despite the potential of NPTs to transform the lives of women and others everywhere, um, uh, NPT development is scientifically and logistically complex. Most of the products are being developed by academic researchers, small biotech companies, and the resources critical for transforming these promising preclinical product candidates into formulations um, and formulations into clinical evaluation remain limited. Uh, equitable access to MPTs will depend on product cost, manufacturing, IP sharing, integration of service delivery models, and others. So this is an opportunity um, for, um, for us to really make a significant impact towards improved sexual and reproductive health globally. So next slide, please. So we encourage you to engage and support with the MPT field through your work and connect with the IMPT through our website where there are various resources, including the database, regulatory and social behavioral resources, publications and more. Um, you can also feel free to reach us directly. And finally, um, next slide, please. Really wish to express my thanks to our collaborators and partners for their contributions to this presentation. Um, this field is really, there's so many dedicated experts who are also willing um, to engage with you. So thank you very much. Over to you, Kirsten. Thank you, Bethany. And my thanks again to all of the presenters. Um, this gave us a lot of, I think, food for thought. Um, and exciting things to to take back to our um, 
our day-to-day -day work in this field of, of um, enhancing availability and access to um, quality sexual and reproductive health care tools for women, men, and couples. Um, we do have time for some moderated uh, discussion. I, I'm seeing in the chat that there are a few requests for the presentation. Um, this webinar is being recorded. I believe that there will be information on how to access the recording. Um, and I uh, understand that the, um, that the presentations will also be circulated um, after the, the webinar. So um, for those who are interested in digging in a little bit deeper into the information presented in these very rich um, and interesting slides, there certainly will be opportunities to do that. Um, Bethany, there are likely some questions for you to answer um, offline, maybe specific to your presentation um, in the Q&A, and please feel free to, to um, just submit some written responses there. We'll do I do that. want to go back to a couple of the questions that that we've received um, for some more open discussion, and we're trying to pull out some higher level uh, questions here, not those that are just very specific to the individual technologies or to the or to the presentations. Um, the the first is a question really around um, on the biodegradable implants. So, uh, Kavita, if we we could have you responding a, a question on you know. Um, Going back to the acceptability studies and how women understood um, the concept of biodegradation and the concept that you know there may be some period of time when they would not be able to have the product removed or reversed. Um, can can you talk a little bit more about um, any women's responses to you know that particular characteristic of the biodegradable implant? How, you know how how do women understand that this is um, being metabolized and degraded in their body and, and actually may not be reversible on demand for some period of time. Um, and if, if there are any um, provider um, thoughts or responses uh, to that concern as well. Um, so as I mentioned, that work was conducted by one of my colleagues. So um, although I've read the report, I don't have the details in the top of my mind, but from what I recall, they, what they did was I thought something that was really innovative. They used a Royco cube or sort of Bouillon cube to in water to sort of demonstrate the concept of biodegradation or bioerodibility. And um, some of the quotes that I recall were, you know, women compared it to other medications, for example, when they take a pill and it dissolves in your stomach. Um, and, uh, you know, they likened the implant dissolving in their arm to something that they would swallow, for example, where, you know, the actual pill sort of dissolves and the medication goes systemically. Um, I think that um, they're working on the manuscript and hopefully those results will be available soon for more details and more quotes. And uh, um, uh, I know that there's a you know, final report that contains more details. I just don't know those off the top of my head to answer the question since it wasn't my work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kavita. And we'll I'll be keenly waiting for those results to be published. Um, I think it's a it's a, an important um aspect. And maybe I'll just add that, you know, I, I think all of our presenters um emphasized choice um and information and you know our our um a measure of quality and family planning and sexual and reproductive health is, you know, having choices, but also informed choice so that women are fully informed about um, how their methods are working, when and how they may be reversed, um, their risk of pregnancy. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, it, enabling um, women to access methods with different product characteristics, but also ensuring that they understand what those product characteristics and the benefits and, and, um, uh, pros and cons, I guess, of each so that they can make an informed choice. Um, a, a high level question that maybe I'll ask each of our presenters to, to spend a, a minute or two answering um, in turn. Um, you all are experts in this field and have worked um, for a, a long time in, in um, enhancing uh, choice and, and availability of sexual and reproductive health products. Um, in your experience, what are the major regulatory hurdles um, that you think that the product developers in, in contraception and reproductive health will encounter today? 
are there specific regulatory requirements that um, you would consider to be overly burdensome or potentially unnecessary when it comes to evaluating the benefits um, and risks of new contraceptive methods? Maybe focusing on you know, the hurdles and, and what we've learned to date, perhaps as, as kind of a lessons learned. Um, maybe we can go in order. Uh, Regine, actually, I saw you come on camera. So um, how, how do you take this question first? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a long time for registering a contraceptive because they are uh, the requirement of 20,000 cycles and to 400 women completing a year for any new contraceptive. A uh, non-new chemical entity would be half of that. But then when it comes to male contraception, there are no guidance because are we considering months of exposure of the men rather than cycles of the women who are in fact having cycles of various duration because they are not taking any product themselves. And it's the first situation where uh, we evaluate a product in a person that has a consequence on a second person, and we evaluate efficacy on the pregnancy on the second person. So it's really something that requires specific guidance, and uh, we are proposing, uh, with the help of consultants, uh, some approach to that, and we hope that uh, we'll have constructive discussions with the FDA to prepare the field for the future. So this is one point I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Bethany, do you want to speak to um, what the IMPT um, has identified as any regulatory um, risks and hurdles for multipurpose prevention technologies? Yeah, so thank you. Um, so this question comes up a lot. Um, so there, there really is limited experience in multi-indication product development for NPTs. Um, there are regulatory standards for single indication products, um, and they can apply to NPTs. But um, you know, it's it's just sort of the the way that the regulatory bodies are really structured are often you know there are different regulatory requirements for say a contraceptive versus an um, an HIV prevention product, so um, or other STIs for that matter, and so you know that is a big challenge, and we're really working with our partners to try to um, provide product developers with with some guidance uh, along those areas. Um, um, another challenge is just navigating the local regulatory requirements. Um, you know, governing registration um, of medicines, and this could, you know, include uh, CMC or chemistry manufacturing controls. And, you know, that's an ongoing challenge. But, you know, many product developers do rely on the on WHO pre um, PQ to facilitate, you know, these, these issues. But um, I guess I'll just say that, you know, this is we're in active discussion <laughs> with partners to try to provide some some guidances around this because you know the big concern is that you know there's so much as I shared so much innovation going on early stages that we certainly don't want to stymie you know these products you know in a few years if we don't have a paved out regulatory pathway and there there's you know opportunities to maybe come together and think about how to smooth that out. So I'll leave it like that. Thank you. Thank you. And I think for both um, male methods and multipurpose prevention technologies, having a first case um, is going to be um, really kind of uh, pivotal uh, for the yeah. entire field once we see what that what that first case and, and some precedents um, for, coming from regulatory agencies. Um, yeah. Kavita, did you want to add anything to the regulatory um, conversation? Sorry, Kavita, you are on mute. Sorry. In terms of the regulatory hurdles, our products have the easy, more easy pathway in that there are guidances, there are known pathways. Um, so, for example, for Casia S, we hope to use a 505B2 pathway because there's another implant containing etanogestrel on the market. And we also hope that 
because of this, we will have to do less in terms of our um, the number of studies we need to do to get the product approved. And, you know, um, ideally, we wouldn't have to do the full 10,000 cycles um, for our, you know, ultimate safety effect and effectiveness trial. We've also considered other pathways in discussing this, you know, whether we could use, for example, a PK only approach and, you know, what would that look like? Um, and so, you know, currently that uh, we're a little, a little far away from what our final um, uh, pivotal trial will look like, but hopefully because it's using etanogestrel in an implant, it won't be as demanding as if it were a new chemical entity or a new implant containing this particular progestin. For our um, other product, our Yale product, even though it does use levonorgestrel, um, as I mentioned, it's a novel copolymer. And so there are additional, um, there's probably additional non-clinical testing that we will have to do because of this novel copolymer, just to look at the safety of that itself. Thank you to all of our speakers. Clearly a, a complex and emerging um, area when we think about uh, regulatory requirements. Um, uh, maybe pivoting to an, another question here. Um, you know, the, 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 the question is really focused on the U.S. Um, ecosystem around the repeal of Roe v. Wade, uh, or the repeal, yeah, the repeal of Roe v. Wade. But I think, you know, we, we're seeing some trends globally um, around uh, increasing um, restriction. Uh, to access of, um, you know, full and informed access to, to uh, contraceptive uh, choice, to reproductive, sexual and reproductive health um, services. Uh, and and I, I would like to put it even in a bigger context, too. You know, over the last five years, we've seen um, a, a global pandemic um, uh, limit women's access to sexual and reproductive health care. Um, we see um, natural disasters limit women's access to um, important healthcare services. Um, but how can, are, are there ways that we can think about, um, you know, what the impacts of those uh, political, environmental, social um, stability changes are on contraceptive research and development? Um, are there things that we could be doing as a development community to prepare um, uh, the um, to, to to develop the next generation of methods that would that would allow um, healthcare systems to be more resilient to these kind of disruptions. Um, Virginie, do you want to take that one first? Well, I think that the more method we develop and involving men to have also a role in the responsibility would decrease the number of unwanted pregnancy and maybe sort one of these um, issues we are facing at the moment. And uh, what we would hope is that the regulation would be less difficult and complicated, but I'm just worried that because of the recent, liti not litigation, I mean, what we have seen uh, would push the FDA to be stricter and more strict <laughs> than stricter <laughs> to, uh, examine the new application for any product and any contraceptive. And it, it's, a, um, but I think if, as if we increase the number of choices and if we involve more men, it will create a, nice, a, a good improvement. Thank you. We are nearing the end of time, so I'm going to end with that um, note of optimism from um, from Dr. Citric Ware. Um, I I agree that you know having increased choices um, will help us uh, support resiliency of healthcare systems, um, bringing methods that are are uh, make it easier for women and men to use and access at their local communities. Um, and so this is going to require concerted effort and and um, increased support. Um, for development of new contraceptive methods for young people, for women, for men, um, for couples globally. I'll turn back over to our um, MC or the host of the day, Emily, for some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsten, and to all of our speakers, Kavita, Regina, and Bethany. 
this was a wonderful event and there's so much interest in this topic just looking through the chat and the q a box everyone has so much to say and so much interest and um, so we're actually really excited to announce today that this is the first in several web webinars in a series that we'll be continuing on the future of the modern method mix um, future webinars will discuss how global funders of contraceptive R&D can support new ideas and how implementers can ensure equitable, sustainable access, which is in line with a few questions we got today. So if you'd like to stay informed about these future events, um, please subscribe to the CTI Exchange. I'm putting a link in the chat now so that you can do that and continue to engage with this conversation through our social media channels and through our platform online. And just thank you all so much for joining um, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.